we are in a series. It's always a bummer when you tune into something in progress because you don't know what happened before. <laughs> this is message number 13 out of the Epistle of Jude. And if you missed the 12 messages that came before, tune into the network. They have them on replay, and also I'm sure they're being posted uh, on my website and um, should be able to catch up real easily. I said this is a very important um, book, and I really hope that some, and I, there's no way for me to say this where it doesn't sound insulting, so just don't have thin skin when I say this, okay? I think some people sit, but they are not really hearing and letting it penetrate. And I'll tell you why I say that. I've been in the middle of talking about spiritual apostasy. Hasn't that been the subject? Yeah. Now, of course, out of the book of Jude, it happens that people crept in that were deliberately creating contention. But this is an admonition for us to really have our guard up because spiritual apostasy doesn't only happen like Jude is describing. Spiritual apostasy happens when we backslide. We become defectors of the faith, essentially, because we're, if you're not moving forward in faith, there's no neutral gear. You're going backwards, and backwards is backsliding. you got people who will sit, and because it's not a nitro pill message, that, you know, instant, gosh, I needed that, that made me feel better as you walk out the door, some sit and they don't take in the instruction. And why this is perplexing, because right in the middle of this subject, someone who's been a fixture here for a really long time, and it really grieves me the way I actually found out about this, just, you know, took off and left. And I'm not, listen, I said, this isn't a cult. You're free to go. But this is somebody who's got a long, long history here. And not even a word of either pray for me or I need some help. And when I say, this is what I'm talking about, sitting in church, you occupy a seat, and that does not count. I'm sorry, maybe in my late husband's day it was filling seats that counts. Yes, it's important. attendance is important to me. But I'll take fewer people who are actually tuned into hearing, listening, and letting it penetrate, as I've said every week, to meditate, to pray, to think about and consider these things, even if they don't seem applicable to you just now. In your whole Christian walk, eventually they will be at some point. And if you basically are, and I think we all are the same, you're gleaning little bits and pieces to see how useful this little book can be. So this right now is an appeal to those people who come in and they are wanting me to be preaching on something that is just for them. And you know what, sometimes that happens, but in a series like this, probably the most important thing that we're going to take away from this is that this happens it happened in Jude's day. Paul wrote about it. Um, even, I hate to tell you, but our Lord dealt with that just by, the, by virtue of how he had to deal with the people who were the religious people of his day who essentially rejected him, which is much what um, in the early passages of Jude we were talking about how some rejected God or God's word. They rejected him. They did not believe he was who he said he was. And that's been happening all the way until the now. So when I say to you it's disturbing, it's because I think I've tried to say every single week, guard yourselves, folks. This is not, you know, if you're looking for a 15-minute sermon to make you, to tell you you're great and everything's good, you're in the wrong place. This is a Bible study. It is, indeed, Dr. Scott had it right. I don't know how many people have attended university, but when you attend a university class, you come in on time, you come in prepared, you come in ready to listen because you know that if the professor is speaking and you miss something, that's going to be your demise ultimately when it comes to having to get a gestalt and pass a test, which, by the way, uh, not passing is not an option because where does that put you? Going nowhere. And that's what m many people end up doing in church, spiritually going nowhere. You come in here, you come prayed up, you come prepared. 
I'm not looking to cater and make this the church of your wants. This is a word-based church that should supply, just as Paul says, every need that you have out of this word, minister to you and give you the instruction at least to consider, meditate, and pray about. Because I guarantee you, in the next few verses, we are going to see how useful this little book, at first blush, doesn't seem to be too much, but believe you me, very useful indeed. So, if you remember back in the beginning of this book, we read one line here out of the third verse, that you should earnestly contend for the faith. And I told you that Greek word is a compound. It has the agonized word in the middle, but that you should earnestly contend for the faith. So Jude has spent the bulk of the body of this epistle explaining why. He's talking about these individuals, and so he spent a lot of time on the why. Now we're going to listen to Jude explain how, why you should contend for the faith against all of these who crept in and their behavior is likened to these Old Testament people, each one of them giving a different dimension. For example, the children of Israel being delivered out of the land of Egypt, but still could not trust God implicitly and listen and obey his instructions, and therefore they essentially didn't enter in. The angels who were in disobedience, right there next to God in disobedience, preferred to follow somebody else who said, come on, it'll be better, taking a third of heaven with him. The angels which kept not their first state and Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. So all of these describe behavior which are, he's attaching obviously to those who crept in, the creeps. Equally, he talks about the way of Cain, the heir of Balaam, and the gainsaying of Korah. And each one of these I've touched on that gives you a dimension of what he is trying to convey. So all of this is the why, why you should contend. Now he turns, this verse 20 marks a transitional part of the book. He turns from why to how, how we should contend for the faith, which is why I quoted that third verse you should earnestly contend. Well, how do you do that? And he starts off by saying, King James, but ye, beloved. So let's just look at this this way. Um, the Greek would actually, not, not that it's a big deal, it may be semantics for somebody, says you, however, and this is why I said it's, it is a turning point because he's just finished talking about what uh, what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ said how they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual not having the spirit. But ye, you however, and this marks a transition, beloved once more, he likes that term. In 25 verses, he uses it three times. Other writings like Paul, you've got 16 chapters of Romans. He doesn't use it that often. So it's actually a lot for this little epistle. But beloved, and he starts by, now we're going to find out how. Building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to take my time here because a lot of times I, I come into these things and I feel as though I have to rush. Does anybody feel like that's all you do all the time is rush? <laughs> I'm pretty tired of that. So the one place I don't want to rush right now is here. So whatever, if your brain is going real fast, just kind of grab hold and stay with me. So I want to look at what is in your King James, building up yourselves. And I want to take a look at that from the Greek. I won't do too much translation. Some are tormented by that, I know. That's not your, your deal. You don't, you don't want to know about Greek. And I, I, I don't understand that, but I sympathize with you. Let's look at that one word, though. Uh, in the Greek, it's epoi oiko domontes. Now, why is this important? At the root of this word, oiko, we get house, 
home, and you've got this uh, prefix ep. So this Greek word actually traveled the root of this. We have in the Greek oikonomia, which traveled into the French first for the word economy that got then brought into the English language. So we get our word from that. But from the Proto-Indo-European uh, root, um, this word actually, strangely enough, our word for economy comes from something that looks nothing like economy, I know. This word weak, which is from the word clan, plus nomos. Strangely enough, managing, managing clan or managing the household from... You're going to love this one. I know you will remember it. Certainly looks like Newman, but it's Neiman, <laughs> which means to manage. That's what he does all day. <laughs> to manage from, that's my dog, if you're wondering who Newman is, from the Proto Indo European root of to assign or a lot or to take. Now, all of that's just fun stuff from the background, but this will be much easier to understand if we follow the words, and I'll just kind of tell you them briefly. I won't write them out because you'll be frustrated with me. But in the Greek, you trace the words, for example, oikonomos, steward. We've got oikonomia, stewardship. Oikodemio, which is built or build, and oikodome, which is building. So when the King James says, building up yourselves, and I just want to stop right there for a minute. We're really, I want to break away from this because there's so many poor interpretations of this verse that it makes it sound as though you are doing something to yourself. And you are in one way, but not in its entirety. So I want you to abandon the word just temporarily of building up yourselves. There are three words there, one word in, word in the Greek. And I want us to focus on another word that will help us to kind of get what Jude is saying here. That word would be foundation. And the reason why I would prefer just right now for the sake of this discussion to use the word foundation is this concept of building up yourselves. I have probably every commentary that you can imagine. And some are very scholarly and some are just more for the layperson and reader, and it ends up that this becomes what you, essentially everything that you are doing. And unfortunately, the imagery that Jude intended is lost in those types of um, translations or versions or understandings. So think foundation first. And the foundation, if you were building something, um, would require a master plan usually by an architect. I love that Hebrews 12 says Jesus is the author and finisher of faith. The author word in the Greek is from where we get our word architect. So think of a foundation, a building being built, Jesus being the architect of... He is our foundation. He is the foundation. But he also becomes the architect let's just say of our building, but it's of our soul. That's so much easier to understand. And I'm going to say this once. I'll probably say it three times while I do this. Uh, much, of, much of the Bible, the New Testament, talks about building. There are many passages that talk about foundation and building. And building yourself up is not working on self-improvement. That's number one. Number two, before you can have some idea of the foundation, this takes me back to a very familiar biblical concept of soil. There has to be soil there, and it has to be good. You can't build on sand. This is not you, by the way. You're not, you are not building. When God called your name, and if you know, there's theological schisms throughout the church on every one of these things I'm saying, I don't care. If you're going to be petty and you're going to find some nuance that you disagree with me on, and it's one nuance, and that is the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, you don't have much faith, and I don't have much faith in your faith. How's that? 
because I'm tired of people getting up. They, they, get their, they get their underwear in a bind. You know what I'm saying? And I'm a little tired of it. I'm very patient, but, you know, well, she said, uh, you know, you ever buy paint? You ever buy paint to paint your house? You know how I many? There are literally, what, thousands, thousands of shades of the color blue. And let's just say that today I said the color blue is 12. And the person over there says, no, it's 50. Oh, I, I, I can't listen to her anymore. It's called Get a Life, OK? <laughs> I mean, we're dealing with tough theological uh, material, and I've tried to m reduce it down in a more comprehensible, easy to follow along, so don't get hung up on the minutia right now. We're not talking about the center point of our faith, Jesus Christ, that he died and that he rose up and that he's... We're not talking about that. We're talking about how to see this and interpret it properly. So please follow me. For a foundation to be built, you need a master planner. That master planner is the architect. He's the one that's going to be building the building. He's the one that says the beginning. When he called your name, you didn't say, hey, I think I'd like my name to be called. He called your name before the worlds were formed. If you believe that, which I do, you need good soil because you can't build on sand. And then there are, from the foundation, and by the way, a, a structure is not complete at the foundation. Now, I built the foundation, but there's nothing else. There's no roof. There's no walls. That's all you got. It's not complete. There are parts of the building. Let's put this down. There are parts of the building. There are materials used. Then there is the purpose of the building. And we might even call it some form of character. I know that's a weird thing to say about a building character, which probably leads us back to design. Foundation and parts of the foundation and the structure that will be built. And it starts with, as I said, soil, foundation, and then the things that must happen in order for a structure to last. Materials. In this case, we're talking about really only two or three things at best. The Word of God, faith, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. And if you want to add in, perhaps, the Holy Spirit. And I say perhaps you need the Holy Spirit, but I'm saying in terms of materials, I don't want to be blasphemous and say that's material. He's a person. The purpose, of course, is eternal. This house, this building up of oneself is not for the now. There is an eternal purpose for the building. And finally, the character. And the character is in some way, shape, or form, it bears the mark of the master builder, not cookie cutter, but bears the mark. Now, wrap all that stuff together, and now let me give you the misinterpretation of this verse. Most people get hung up on building up yourselves, and they think building, and they think scaffolding. And the vast majority of Christendom is stuck on what the scaffolding looks like. Does that bring it all together now? Because the scaffolding will be taken down. It is irrelevant. It is not there to stay. It's only being used for a time, but the rest, the structure itself. And that's what you have to strip away, all of this stuff. I always, it really does, I hate to say it like this, it really does bother me. Because people do not spend enough time in the Word. And I made mention of this last week, and I think I mentioned it, on festival of people who, for example, let's just say my late husband talking about, well, you know, he, he smoked cigars or, you know, he, he collected wine or whatever it is. Well, the problem is that's scaffolding, friends. That's scaffolding. That has nothing to do with building up yourselves and this word right here, which is probably the most important, most holy faith, and we'll talk about that in a minute, has nothing to do with that. So people get hung up on the scaffolding, and they forget that the, the foundation and the building is what we're talking about. Our 
our pettiness in the things that we cannot agree on is still scaffolding. The main center point, Christ our Savior died, rose, and is coming back. I hate to be that simplistic, but anything else short of that, you're not following Christ. And we know that, as I said, the materials, the word and faith. And why do I keep saying this? Because it is impossible to understand what the will of God is without spending time in this word. I've heard this most of my Christian life. I wish to know, I want God's will. I don't think I'm in God's will. Well, friend, you better get in the book because before God's going to give you some special revelation, and he may not, you better know his will cover to cover. And I'm not saying memorize it, but there are 66 books there for a reason for you to find out God's will as he revealed it, as it was recorded by those who put it down on paper for us to read to know about him. Start there. Now, it seems like when I say the word and faith, well, sure, of course, that's what's required. But how can you know or say you know about something if you're not exposed to the material? And I'm really not speaking to those in the sanctuary. I may be speaking more to those who don't really read or study the Bible, think, well, I'd rather go and hear somebody deliver a nice, feel-good homily for 15 minutes than learn about the book. Because the fact of the matter is, the Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed, God-inspired. Even the things that we don't really like or make us feel uncomfortable, it's all God-breathed, inspired. So it's important to stay in the Word and study the Word. And as you stay in the Word and study the Word, Faith comes, faith grows, faith takes, the word takes root. So when he says, building up yourselves, I want to look at that Greek word. Let me go back now. This epoiko domontes. Say that ten times. <laughs> what I want us to look at is, and I just want you to see this one thing, aside from the fact that it's a verb, I'll parse it for the people who are interested and it's a participle, in the imperative sense, as the Greek lets you do that. But here's the, here's the key one. It is present. And I said carefully, when I said, you know, people like to say this is what you're doing. It is active. But I'll go back to explain why I was so careful to tell you about a foundation. So... The key thing right here is this building up yourselves on your most holy faith is present, which means start and ongoing. It continues. It does not end. It's ongoing. It's continuous. You don't just come into church and somebody preaches something and you say, okay, or you step forward and the preacher says you're saved and that's it. it requ- this is what's required. The active portion is Faithing, and I should define this a little bit better when it says your most holy faith. It's a little bit, again, the way this is translated, it's slightly misleading. What, how this should be understood is if you go back once more to um, that verse 3 when it says you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's what we're talking about when he says most holy faith. We're talking about the logos the word, the gospel. We're not talking about your holy faith because your holy faith wouldn't make sense. There is no such thing. We talk about holy, the word in the Greek, that is set apart. So it's something from the beginning that verse 3 takes us back to let us know what we are contending for. Now he's turned to the why, or the how rather, which is building yourselves upon your most holy faith. That which you have Receive. This is why he says, contend, fight for it, be vigilant. If you are in the state where you're, you don't care, this is where I said this message applies today more than you know. You're in a state of you don't care, you're unmoved, the church doesn't matter, let's move away from the church. Your faith life has just gone sour. Your prayer life is non-existent. Listen, I'm not, I'm not criticizing you. I've said, 
the whole, your whole Christian life will be a series of these ups and downs. Anybody that says you, you spend your time on the mountaintop is a liar. There are probably more valleys as Christians than there are mountaintop experiences. Anybody want to say differently? As you have a different experience, please, this is the time to stand up and testify. <laughs> there are more, we spend more time in the valley. And I, you may say, this is absolutely nutty, but I believe the reason why we spend so much time in the valley is that's where our character, the design, the purpose is brought forth over and over and over again. Sometimes we're brought into darkness in a valley to be able to better understand something. Sometimes it's to keep us, I think a lot of times, from going over the edge. You might think, well, I feel like I'm at the edge. Well, maybe God has you there. So now, because you know you're in a valley and you're in darkness, you start praying again. I just talked about people who don't pray anymore. Don't ask why stuff is happening to you what good is that going to do anyway? Who's going to answer you? And I mean, like, audibly, who's going to answer you? You know, we do this. Oh, why is this happening to me? I don't understand it. Well, okay, it's happening. And I'm not saying, okay, deal with it. I am. But, <laughs> but what I'm really saying is maybe God has a hand in those places too. I quoted this several times from Dr. Scott. The greatest blessings that Abraham had for example, were in the famine. And, you know, he coined it, God's a famineizer. What I'm trying to say is, if you look carefully, you see that it's very easy to take something for granted and let it slip. And the minute you let it slip, it becomes, you have blatant disregard for the things of God. You don't care as much. It's like, why is it that some people come in and they are, you can't keep them away. They're so giddy and they're so excited and they just can't wait to be there on Sunday and then something just kind of disappears. And then some of you, I look around, some have been here way before my time. That means some of you are like pushing on, you know, 40 plus, some of you, shh, years. <laughs> so my point is this. It is something that we need to be on guard about. This is why I said the turning point is those that he was discussing all this time, those that crept in. Let's go back for a second and see why it's so important to wrap your mind around that whole body of the epistle to come back to building yourselves up on your most holy faith, which I don't really want to translate the rest of that. We'll do that maybe next week or on festival. But the main point is this building up is an ongoing process. It's not anything but we'll call it exercising faith, practicing faith. That is in contradistinction to, look at verse 5, those who, those who the Lord delivered out of the land, but it, King James says, afterwards he destroyed them that believed not, even though they saw the miracles. That means that we cannot walk by sight ever. Well, does that happen to you? Yeah, it does. We all slip into that, but that's where you kind of have to have a reality check. I'm not walking by the things that I can see. I'm walking by faith. These, even though they saw, it was never enough. That's why when people say to me, well, why doesn't God do these things anymore? Why? Because he did them before. There's a reason why this is recorded, so we can learn that it didn't work the first time, the second or the third, because he showed and put on display his Shekinah glory for the people to see not just the children of Israel as he delivered them out, but the whole Old Testament is a record of his presence right down to the book of Ezekiel where you see the presence going away, further and further away, leaving the temple. All of this is designed to say God showed himself and it still didn't. It didn't bring more faith. It didn't bring more anything. So there's one. The second one is the angels, when it says they kept not their first estate, well, they prefer to listen to somebody else's authority. This is why we're contending for the faith. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Not, I'm going to do and I'm going to be. You keep faithing, and there's only one way to do that. You have to stay connected. The meat and potatoes of everything. And, you know, some people say, well, I don't have to come to church to be connected. Okay, 
Um, maybe that's true for some people, but for the vast majority, I don't think so. Because you know what happens? Eventually, it becomes, I'll get around to it tomorrow. I'll read my Bible later. There is no discipline. We, as creatures, we, tell me that you are, by nature, disciplined to do anything in your life. <laughs> Didn't think so. But when it comes to God, people who just don't want to be disciplined at all and know that, listen, I am not the, the cattle prodder rounding up the cattle and come on, let's go, but I am putting out the call, the gospel message. And it is a staggering thing to see how many people will say, well, I, I don't need to do that. Well, how, how do you get acquainted with learning about these things and being able to recognize them if you're not studying them. Interesting thing happened to me this week, and I'm sorry to put this in, but it really was a, a, an eye-opener for me. I don't really go on social media. I really just stay away from it by and large because, first of all, it's like a black hole. Once you step in, it sucks you in, and you, you think you're only going to be there for five minutes, and you could be there for five hours, right? Has that happened to you? So I just kind of avoid that pretty much. But I was looking up something not related to my studies and happened on a young lady who um, has trained herself uh, in spite of all of her disabilities, um, everything that you could possibly not qualify for, for being, um, we'll call it a very high-ranking gymnast. Um, not, I don't know if she'll ever make it to the Olympics, but um, I, I listened to what she said, and it was just very brief, came out of this young lady's mouth, and I said, I'm not going to forget that. She said, you know, we all make choices. I made a choice to dedicate myself to as far as my limitations would take me and push beyond to excel. I made a decision to do this regardless of what anybody said. And she just says flat out, she says, we all have choices. We all can make decisions. Now, that's not a new statement. That's not a new thought. But coming out of that mouth from that perspective, it was rather eye-opening because she could have just sat and listened and said, yeah, uh, I can't do this, and they tell me I can't do that, and I whatever. She made a decision. Now, you want to call that determination? Do you want to call that tenacity or moxie or whatever? But the same discipline that is required for something else out there, I'm not saying as rigidly, can be applied here. And let me go back and say one other sidebar about this. Um, well, people talk about works. You're not saved by works, and I don't, I've not preached works. I don't tell you to do works, so I want to make sure no one is interpreting this verse as building up yourselves on your most holy faith is equals works and you do them. No. We're talking about faith and we're talking about faith in operation. To counterbalance, we'll call it because the King James says believe not, disbelief or disfaith, to counterbalance rejecting God's authority, to counterbalance things that essentially are against God's ways, to counterbalance those who would professed to have received a word from the Lord, but actually it was just their own imagination. To counterbalance, if you will, the first, as I said, false religion. To counterbalance those who are chasing after things, tangibles. To counterbalance those who say, well, you're not the only one. In contrasting that, he says, building up yourselves, ongoing, starting from now, and you keep going. Why? Because it is very easy to be swayed with every wind of doctrine to slip away. You know, people think, well, I, you know, backsliding, you know, that's somebody else, that's not me. Oh, yeah? Let's talk about degrees of backsliding then. Even though I'm talking about spiritual apostasy here and how to, as Jude lays it out, let's talk about this for a second. What happens when people start backsliding? The first thing I'm going to tell you is you'll, you'll encounter other people who are either praying or very much into the word or they want to share something with you and you'll have some grumbling or some form of resentment or some disdain for it. I'm not talking about the people that assault you on the street corner. 
or the guy that's standing, you know, at the corner where Denny's is and he holds the cross and he dances. I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I saw him yesterday. He must have burned a thousand calories out there. But I am talking about those people who it somehow it, it, it it's like, well, I, I, I don't like that, or that makes me uncomfortable. Well, that's that, that, that's, that's that person's faith. That's that person's faith. You find yourself less and less interested in reading the Bible. And that, by the way, comes from being maybe at times so familiar, familiar familiarity breeds contempt, so familiar with the word that it's just like, oh, well, I'm, I know this. I can quote chapter and verse. I, I don't need to study this. I don't need this to be parsed for me. No, you need to hear it about a thousand more times. That's part of the problem for it to sink into the cranium. Now, people think backsliding is, you know, one day you're here and then the next day. No, it happens. It, it, will, it will seem imperceptible, but there are signs. There are definitely signs. That's why we keep playing VF-166 on the network. If you don't know what that is, watch it. And those of you who do, you probably do like I do when I watch it. I, I speak along with Dr. Scott. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But my point is that there is a host of shipwrecks to be made by folks who can't seem to understand this is an ongoing process. There are people who get so weighted down and so burdened by the world's pressures, by every other thing, that they're, they're no longer able to get up in faith. Build yourselves up. Ongoing, you don't stop. Even on a day when you got out of bed and you don't feel like it. You have those days ever? Okay, so I'm not by myself. You get up. You keep faithing. Now, what's interesting about this is, is I think this verse, as well as a few other verses, were used, believe it or not, to kind of create a separatist movement, probably about early 19th century, within Protestantism, which birthed, out of it, terribly, fundamentalism. It was a movement against modern theology. And so everything became this, again, scaffolding. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't breathe. But fundamentalism wasn't at its inception. That wasn't the idea. It was to counterbalance things like Darwinism and um, the challenge of social sciences, which that whole movement of modern theology, which tried to explain the gap between fossils that were found, for example, and taking the Bible and saying, well, thus saith the word of God, this is how creation happened, it's recorded there. And so some of these verses people have used out of context, including, by the way, um, praying in the Holy Ghost, which does not mean you're praying in tongues. I've also heard many people say that. What that is essentially saying is, You're praying with the help of the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit helps us. Remember, I did that demonstration of, you know, you've got a heavy load. You pick up one end, he picks up the other end, and he goes with you. That's just like that. So when it says praying in the Holy Ghost or in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help you to pray. When these things come, as you keep building your faith up, as you keep In the word, as you keep pressing on, you claim promises. You find things within this book that you can daily meditate on. If it's not Bible reading, maybe it's just a verse. Maybe you write down a verse. I'm not suggesting there are some people that like to memorize scripture. I think it's inevitable. If you've been in the word long enough, there's going to be verses of scripture that you you begin to know off by heart. It wasn't your design, but it happened that way. You put it in your brain, and you may say, well... There's too much information in there right now. There's not enough room for that. Ha, 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 ha. (laughs) Nice try. Try that on somebody else. The storage in in your brain is probably only 5% used right now. It means there's plenty of room for you to put the word in there and fill it up. So let's come back to the text. This is the turning point. In contrast to those folks that he's been describing, he says, however you, beloved, building up yourselves, now that that's clear of the meaning, it's not just one time, it's ongoing, in your most holy faith, that is the faith, what that they're contending for, which was once received, the doctrine, the gospel. Now you tell me, is there anything apart from 
your husband or your wife, or maybe I can't think of anything else, country certainly comes in there, but can you think of anything that you, you would say I would be, I would die for because it's worth that much to me? In our day and age, we can't really comprehend, but in the day of Jude's day and others, they did. I'll die for that because those that died as martyrs were not going to stop preaching the word. They were willing to die for it. Today, we're just, you know, we're just so kind of blasé about it. It doesn't matter. That's why church has become an entertainment center. That's why if you, listen, I could change the music. I could make the music more, um, we'll call it more um, stained glass, you know, more traditional. But I'm not saying traditional music is bad. I love traditional music. But what we do here is unique to us. And somebody else does it differently somewhere else. I don't judge them. It's not my business to judge. If the whole idea behind what you're doing is to get somebody's focus onto Christ, whether it's through contemporary music or traditional music, I don't care. And then there'll be people that say, well, you can only have traditional music, contemporary music. Well, you know what that leads to. Uh, enjoyment, foot tapping, <laughs> being happy. Never mind. So you can see here, this is the first of his instructions. And why do I say that this is paramount for us to take in? Because there'll be more instructions. The first one is, of course, as I said, building yourselves up in the doctrine, the word of God. The true foundation is Christ with the help of the Spirit who helps us to pray. The next one, keep yourselves in the love of God. This one will require a little bit of translation, but I'm not going to do it now because it's too late and I'm going to run out of time. So the first one is building up yourselves connected to faith. The second one is keep yourselves in the love of God. Let me ask you something, and it's rhetorical. Even though it sounds like you should answer, it's rhetorical. What do you think that means for you and for me? Keep yourselves in the love of God. You know, God loves the sinner. Doesn't love the sin, but loves the sinner. Is, is that what you're thinking? No. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, if I'm bad, will God not love me anymore? No, that's not what I'm saying either. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Remember, one of my favorite passages is out of John. And Jesus says to the disciples, if you have love to one another, this is how people will know that you're my disciples. And how do you have love toward one another in a day and age where uh, most of us are mass murderers, according to Jesus? Because Jesus said, if you hate in your heart, you're as guilty as a murderer. Right? Okay, I rest my case. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That is attached to faith. That means an ongoing process. It's not a one-time event. It's not once saved, always saved. It's not, I'm there and I'll stay there. It's a connection. The best one, I think, that I can think of is power cord. Plugging in, you've got to stay plugged in. That source of power, which is faith, brings God's love into your heart, which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that lets us radiate outwards his love onto our brothers. It's not our love fabricated, because even the heathens have love. We're talking about a different type of love being explained. Then he says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we have three actions here, building up yourselves, keeping yourselves and looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So just right there in two verses, we have the at least a portion of the how to contend. He's not done. But this is what I want to talk about, how to contend, because the rest of my time here should be bringing this to application you know, at times I preach and I say, you, you pray about it, you think about it, but here we need to have some application. Now, it seems self-explanatory, but I ask you a question. Why is it that so many people get so weak in the faith and fall away? Is that, let me give you the multiple choices. Some people say it's my fault. Some people would blame me, which is ridiculous because you make your own decisions. I'm not in control of your life. This isn't a cult. I've said the door is there if you want to go. You make your own decisions. Why is it that people get into that state that then lets them slip back 
And, and the slip is not just a little bit. Once you start sliding, it's, it, it goes. You, you go. Person says, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested in, and they'll fill in the blanks. This is why this is so important, building up yourselves on what doctrine, what you've heard out of the book, the word you have received. And you are to be vigilant about that. This church, I don't know about any other church, but this church has this wonderful thing of people coming in and being faithful for a long time, and then they get tired. I understand what being tired is. I go through extreme bouts of insomnia, insomnia times where um, I function on at least one person here in the building who would be able to attest that sees me at all hours moving around, um, that I'm coming and going in my vehicle. I'll usually pass by some, some of the locations just to see what other people are doing at that hour. <laughs> Redeeming the time. But my point is that it is very easy to fall into a trap that then you say, well, I'm tired and I'm worn out. Well, isn't that what being on the spiritual battlefield is? I mean, who said it was going to be easy? Who said that you were going to come in here or come into a church that's teaching and pointing you in the direction of the gospel and say, this is going to be very sweet and very easy? And anybody who tells you that, I, I don't know what they're where they're walking, because the real battlefield is still the same thing. It's a battle for your soul. It's a battle to get you to be one, like one of these, an apostate. Fall away, and it really doesn't matter how, but in this particular case, I said application time. Now, for some people, they, don't, they, have an ex they really do have an excuse. They don't have access to material that's faith-building. This network provides continuous streams and books and CDs for people to continue during the week as many hours as you want and connect with a specific subject, a specific uh, message, whatever it is, because there's no excuse. So when somebody says to me, well, you know, somebody's having a hard time, I have sympathy, I'll pray for them. We all struggle. Everybody struggles. But the key thing is you have to keep getting up. And when you keep getting up, you're acting in faith. And that faith act is still an ongoing process. You keep building. You keep going. There isn't a stopping point down here. And some of us sure wish there was at least to take a small break, but there isn't. And it keeps, you keep going, and time keeps going. And one day turns into the next, that turns into the next, which is the next year, which is 10 years, which is now 700 messages for me later. And I'm not thinking, wow, 700 messages later. I'm thinking, I wonder how many of those messages I won't know until I get over there. Where somebody sat down, maybe one message, where somebody sat down and said, that ministered to me and it helped me to get clarity. I have to keep fighting on. I have to keep fading on. I have to keep going. Because there's a lot of people that just quit. Dr. Scott used to say, God hates quitters. It's easy to quit. Drop out of the race. Paul described it as a race. Just drop out. Just, just take off. Get in your car and drive off somewhere, right? It's easy to quit. And I'm just talking to the one person that specifically it, it is a heart matter to me. But in general, let me ask you this. Do you think there's days when I want to quit? Some of you are afraid to say the answer. Do you think so? I, 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 yeah. There's many days where I just say, what's the point? It's been a very tough journey. I was, this morning, I was thanking God while I was, my prayer and devotional time, I was thanking God for giving me the time with Dr. Scott, for, for allowing me the privilege and the honor to be by his side. But I can tell you, from 2005, it's just been, it has been a battle. It's a battle one way or another. It's people trying to do things that are so malicious and so ridiculous to destroy this work or to tear me down or you name it. And have there been times when I've just said, this is just ridiculous. No one should have to go through this. Remember what I just said to you about willing to die for? All? I'm going to tell you something. It took me, it's, it's taken me 50 years to get here. 
there isn't anything on this earth that I want. There isn't anything on this earth that I need. But the one thing I cannot go without is my relationship with God. And my relationship with God comes out of this book, my love for him. And yeah, I would say it's pretty big words to say, but I'd say willing to die for. Even I'd put this above country and above family even. I got to tell you something. I don't have the ability to understand. I wish I did. Why for some of you, when you're struggling, instead of giving way and becoming part of that group of people that maybe in eternity will be saying what they should have done, you pick yourselves up and you say, no matter what's going on, I will not forfeit all of the battles that I've been through and all of the valleys that I've walked through because this one seems just so unbearable and so tough that's leading you into a state of apostasy, uh, into a defector of the faith. And maybe this little book, as I said, has a lot more instruction than we know because a lot of times we've said, well, you know, we don't do this and we don't do that. But you start reading and you realize Jesus even had compassion. He, it said, King James uses the strange word, bowels of compassion. He had compassion on people. I'm not saying for us to fabricate, but I'm saying the Spirit of God helps us to be compassionate. We're not judges. We're not walking around saying, well, you're a doctrine or you're this or you're that. What we are is contending for the faith and the doctrines we've received, the things that we know that without them, we have no life, and there is no life eternal without them. We, we look at all this, and this is the foundation of everything. So when I come back to this building imagery, I want to make sure that everybody in the sound of my voice realizes one thing. We all have moments. We all have struggles. We all have the time we say, I just can't do it anymore. But building yourself up isn't, this is going to be easy and this is going to be fun. It means you get up. You get up sometimes even if you say, I can't. While you're saying, I can't, you do. And somehow, before you know it, you're up. And the devil can't win. And that spirit that is the overcoming, victory-getting spirit will help you. Now, if you take these instructions, I said it's application time here. You take these instructions. Please pray at least for these two verses. Please pray about what's in them and at least initially have explained them. Because a lot of our, you know, the word community in Christendom is tossed around a lot, but community comes obviously from a root word of, of communion or togetherness or withness. Our community, and I mean it like that, our communion, our community is usually very dysfunctional and very injured either by people trying to be something they're not and being overbearing or being so distant and they have no, no compassion, no ability to realize other people do struggle. I'm not telling you get involved and go sink yourself in somebody else's ship. But in the process of building yourself up in the doctrines you've received, it takes you back to the things specifically of the gospel where you read about the instructions that Christ gave to his disciples and there you come full circle again to what I really need to hear, what I really need to receive, and the basics of my faith. The days that are tough and the days that I don't feel like going on, I look back and I say, wow, I was such an idiot. Because if I thought those days were hard and I made it through those days, wait, there's more. And... Cheer up, saints. It's going to get worse. There's going to be a bigger one ahead of me. I need to learn how to be building myself up even in those times because although Jude is not talking about spiritual warfare, I'm adding this in here because it is part of the possibility of people backsliding and defecting from the faith, which is essentially you have no reason. You have no purpose. Why am I here? Why do I do this thing? What did I say to you? Are you not part of the body? Are you not part of the body of Christ? 
So how can one say, I have no purpose? If you're part of the body of Christ, we're not talking about a building. We're talking about belonging to him. Part of the body of Christ means I have a purpose in his body. Now, the purpose may not be clear, but it's my responsibility to keep building myself up until either the clarity comes or I'm standing in his presence and I can certainly clear my voice to ask one small question. Why? (laughs) (laughs) Now, this is, as I said, this is a, an interesting part of the book. There are a few more things that I'd like to share with you. Not today. I'll save them for possibly next week if I continue. But I, what I want you to take away are those two verses to pray and meditate on what they might mean to you as you go through your struggles, as you go through your week, as you face things that, or even individuals that may criticize you for your faith or the things that you stand for, the doctrines that you've received. You keep building yourself up, you keep marching on, and you keep looking unto him who is indeed the architect, the master builder and designer, and who knows exactly, by the way, how to bring the building to completion. He gave the recipe, it's right in here, the formula is right in here, faith, that'll take you home. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.